Hello, and welcome to the latest Expert Series webinar. Today's presentation is Extensions of the Fundamental Index Methodology, the Long-Short Alternative. This is a complimentary ETF.com webinar, courtesy of ProShares. I'm Ollie Ludwig, the Managing Editor of ETF.com. We are the leading authority on news and data about ETFs. And we are the company behind Inside ETFs, the world's biggest ETF conference. Joining me today are Rob Arnott of Research Affiliates and Joanne Hill of ProShares. Rob Arnott hardly needs an introduction, but I'll go ahead anyway. He is the chairman and CEO of Newport Beach, California-based Research Affiliates. And in 2002, Rob established Research Affiliates as a research-intensive asset management firm that focuses on innovative products. He is one of the founders of the Fundamental Index Movement, and this forum explores novel approaches to active asset allocation, optimal portfolio construction, and indexation. Joanna Hill, she is the head of investment strategy at Bethesda, Maryland-based ProShares. Joanna is the head of investment strategy at ProShares Advisor. She spent more than 25 years on Wall Street, including 17 years at Goldman, where she was a managing director. A bit of housekeeping before we get started today. I may chime in with a question or two along the way, but I want to stress that, uh, to everyone that there will be a Q&A at the end that I'll moderate. All of you can ask questions at any time during the webinar in the window at the lower right of your screens. Also, bear in mind that the presentation will be available to all of you 24 to 48 hours following today's webinar. Smart beta is, by now, a big and growing piece of the ETF universe. If we liberalize the definition, we are the numbers we crunch here at ETF.com suggest that upwards of $200 billion in U.S. ETF assets are now benchmarked to so-called smart beta. And that includes fundamental indexes created by Rob Arnott's research affiliates. And these strategies are marketed by a number of sponsors, including PowerShares and Charles Schwab, and of course, ProShares. Now, ProShares likes to refer to itself as the alternative ETF company. And it seems to me that the strategy we'll talk about today does fit that bill. Today, we're going to focus on the ProShares Buffy Long Short ETF. This fund has almost 50 million in assets under management. It trades under the symbol RALS. It came to market in late 2010. As the name suggests, RALS is a long, short, absolute return strategy that can control risks. And crucially, it provides downside protections in times of market drawdowns. It's basically taking a cutting edge indexation methodology the Rafi methodology from Rob's company, and adding a long, short piece to it and wrapping it all up in an efficient and cheap ETF. We'll talk about how the dynamic value tilt of Rafi screens works in the context of this security, how to situate this fund in a competitive context, and crucially, how this ETF can fit into a portfolio. We're fortunate to have two bright and dynamic executives to guide us in this discussion, including, as I said a moment ago, Rob Arnott of Research Affiliates and Joanne Hill of ProShare. So, Rob, you're up. Take it away, please. Well, thank you all very, very much for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us here today. Uh, what I'd like to do is begin by taking you through some of the key principles of the fundamental index, which is the core driver for the Rawls strategy, and then take you through how we transform the fundamental index concept into a long-short strategy. Now, as a long-short strategy, this is not the kind of strategy that is intended to beat a bull market or to uh, fall less than a bear market. It is an absolute return strategy. It is something that's uh, that seeks to produce uh, meaningful returns and seeks to do so by being long uh, the deep value companies that are bigger in their fundamental economic footprint than the market gives them credit for in market capitalization and 
short the companies that the market gives massively more credit for than their economic footprint would seem to uh, justify. And so let's dive into this. Firstly, just by way of background, Research Affiliates itself is a company that's best known for our work in asset allocation. We manage global asset allocation strategies for PIMCO. And in Smart Beta, where we license our ideas in a fundamental index to an array of organizations, in total, there's $166 billion in assets managed using these strategies under license from us. Uh, we date back 12 years at this stage. The fundamental index we like to describe as an, in, an efficient index for an inefficient market. What do we mean by that? Well, in an efficient market, prices always match their fair value. Um, hardly any practitioner, and these days, hardly anyone in academia really believes that anymore. Instead, most people believe that the markets are seeking fair value, but that the prices are rarely right, that the market gets it wrong. Sometimes the price is too high, sometimes too low. If that's the case, capitalization-weighted indexes will automatically overweight the companies that ultimately turn out to be overvalued and underweight the companies that ultimately turn out to be undervalued. The problem is you can't know in advance which ones are over or undervalued. But we can anchor on something meaningful. can't anchor on fair value because you don't know what it is, but you can anchor on something meaningful, like the economic footprint of a company's business, and transform that constant shifting expectation of the market into incremental return. Let me show how that works. Take a look at the tech bubble. Cisco reached 4% of the U.S. stock market in March of 2000. How big was the company's business? Well, it had over 20,000 employees, and it was priced at over $25 million per employee. Hire a new executive assistant, and the company goes up $25 million in market capitalization. Well, that's what it seemed to be, priced at 180 times earnings. And the market got it right. This was a growth company. It was twice as big two years later. My goodness, the market did a wonderful job, except it didn't. It priced the company way higher than anything that the subsequent growth would have justified. Was Cisco on track to become 4% of the U.S. macro economy? No. It was on track to become larger than the 0.2% that it was at the time. And so the market capitalization faded and began to converge towards a fair value that was higher than the fundamental economic footprint, but smaller than the market cap. Did you win by owning the market cap? Heavens no. Did you win by owning the fundamental weight? Yes, because you had a much lower weight and the stock underperformed. In the depths of the financial crisis, we had an anti-bubble in 2009. B of A, which was 2% of the macro economy measured by sales, profits, book value, and dividends over the prior five years, was priced at 0.6% of the U.S. stock market. Actually, at the low, it was priced at 0.3% of the U.S. stock market. It was priced for high risk of oblivion. Was it likely to face oblivion? Well, it was certainly a possibility, but there would have been others failing before B of A would. And so what we looked at was a circumstance in which if the U.S. economy imploded, B of A could go to zero. But if the economy survived, it was likely to move back towards its share of the macro economy. Get all the way to 2% of the market cap, you don't need that to happen. All it has to do is to move back towards that. So by anchoring on the economic footprint of the company in the macro economy, Fundamental Index simply uses that very stable footprint. Notice that these economic footprints don't change much year to year. 
use that stable economic footprint to contra-trade against the market's constantly changing expectations. If we're not going to use price weighting, which is basically what market capitalization does, it weights in direct proportion to the share price, we want weighting metrics that don't take price into account. We want widely accepted measures of company size, the size of the company's book of business. We want, therefore, to have uh, measures of size that will then be uh, co-integrated with liquidity and capacity. By waiting on company size, you're still going to be focusing on big companies that have high turnover, high trading costs, high capacity, and broad economic representation, except that instead of looking like the stock market, it looks like the broad macro economy. Think of it as an index designed to resemble the macro economy instead of the market. Fundamental measures of the size of a company's business is the answer. You can measure the size of a company using multiple measures, just as the size of our footprint in the sand at the beach has multiple measures, the size of a company in the economy has multiple measures. Sales, profits, dividends distributed to the shareholders, net worth of the company, these are all good objective measures. And they lead to different companies at the top, as you can see on this exhibit. Walmart is the largest company in North America in terms of its sales. 3.7% of all sales in the United States are made by Walmart. ExxonMobil is the most profitable. AT&T pays the most dividends. Uh, B of A, despite all the write-offs, has the largest net worth. Four different companies, four different industries is number one by one of these measures. Number one by market capitalization, Apple isn't in the top 10 by any of these measures. Its fundamental economic footprint would appear to be about 0.6% of the macro economy, about a fifth the size of ExxonMobil. Now, one thing that we can do is pick one of these measures and use it. That's a perfectly legitimate choice. Another is to average them so that we're not exposed to, let's say, the Walmart effect, companies that have big sales on thin margins, um, or the um, uh, aggressive accounting effect uh, that would show up under current book value, companies that use aggressive accounting uh, to maintain a large book value. And so what we find is that as we look across the spectrum, we find a wide array measures of company size, if we average them, we smooth the rough edges off the process. ExxonMobil is about 3% of the U.S. economy. And if we use that as our size, it's not going to change much next year. And it winds up being a wonderful, stable anchor for contra trading against the market's constantly changing views. Apple, the market has it at 3.5% of the stock market, so the market is tacitly betting that Apple will be 3.5% of all future business in the United States, or more particularly, 3.5% of all wealth distributed to shareholders in the decades that lie ahead. Could it happen? Sure. Is it likely to happen? Mm, could argue about that but it's priced in the market. It has to happen in order for Apple to merely be a market performer, to merely match the market. In fact, worldwide, it has to be the number one source of profit distributions to shareholders on the planet in order to merely match the global stock market in the years ahead. And when we look at how well weighting companies by other measures performs, we find that it does awfully well. Book value weighting delivers 11.5% a year, going back over a half a century. Sales weighting delivers 12.5%. The composite, averaging the four measures of company size, works better than the average of the four, with less risk than the average of the four, with tracking error relative to the stock market that's nearly the lowest of the four. Marvelous. Really neat idea. 
Can we do it even simpler than that? Sure, we could just take the S&P 500 and equally weight it. <laughs> it works just as well. All we're doing, it has nothing to do with choosing the right fundamental measures. All we're doing is breaking the link with price. Equally weighting the S&P 500 does exactly the same thing. The only problem with that is that equally weighting the S&P 500 introduces a liquidity challenge, introduces a lot of weight focused on small, illiquid companies, higher turnover, higher volatility, and much higher tracking error. So the fundamental index has huge capacity, just like cap weighting, has large focus on big, liquid companies, has surprisingly market-like look, lower tracking error, and therefore is a much easier core portfolio to embrace. If we take this idea and explore use of it around the world, we find some common themes. The less efficient the market, the more fundamental index adds value. It adds 2% a year in the US going back 52 years. It adds 2.1% a year on average in the 23 countries in the MSCI developed world index, a little better. And that goes back 30 years. It adds 2.8% a year in international small companies, 3.8% a year in US small companies, 3.8% a year in an all-world application in which we identify the 3,000 largest businesses in the world and simply weight them by how big their business is. And get this, 7.2% a year in emerging markets. How on earth can it add 7.2% a year in emerging markets? Very simple. Cap weighting in emerging markets in each of these little countries puts most of your money in the two or three companies that are globally recognized, well-connected, uh, uh, well-recognized, well-respected, and extravagantly expensive. Fundamental indexing puts your money in the broad economy in the emerging markets, the economies that are, in fact, growing fast. So let's take a look at how we transform this into a long short strategy. With absolute return strategies, the goal is to profit regardless of market direction. You want to take on limited market exposure, beta roughly zero. Now in constructing this, we decided to allow a little beta to creep into the portfolio. That is to say, if the beta of our longs was larger than the beta of our shorts or vice versa, we were OK with that. We want a very low correlation with traditional asset classes. And we want to construct a strategy to isolate the advantage of the fundamental index. How do we do that? If the fundamental weight of a company is bigger than its cap weight, we put it in the long portfolio. If it's smaller than its cap weight, we put it in the short portfolio. Long the companies that are fundamentally overweight short the companies that are cap overweight. And it's that simple. So what are the fundamental weights that we use? We use sales, not sales, price to sales ratios, just the sales. How big is the company's annual sales over the last five years? Then we look at profits, operating income plus depreciation and amortization, the cash flow of the company. What's the average of that over the last five years? Then we look at dividends paid out to shareholders over the last five years. Then we look at the book value, the most recent book value, because it already takes account of multiple years of retained profits. And so the overall weight is the average of the company's sales weight, cash flow weight, dividend weight, and book value weight. If the company doesn't pay dividends and hasn't for the last five years, we simply average the other three measures. Missing or negative factor values are simply truncated to zero. So if a company has negative profits, we're not going to punish it with a negative weight for profits. So it's a very simple approach.
We want not to exclude companies just because they're tiny market cap or tiny fundamental scale. So we take the thousand largest companies in fundamental economic footprint in the economy and the thousand largest companies by market cap. That combined list of companies today is about 1,300 companies. So that's our list of companies that we start with. And we then take the 20% companies that have the largest fundamental weight relative to their cap weight and the 20% largest companies by cap weight relative to their fundamental weight. And we put the former in the long portfolio and the latter in the short portfolio. So we're basically taking the top quintile of each sector in the long portfolio and the bottom quintile of each sector in the short portfolio. And by doing so, we create sector neutrality so that we aren't taking on massive sector tilts that can create huge uh, uh, tracking error, huge uh, volatility in performance that is very sector dependent. The portfolio is reconstituted annually. The RAFI weights are calculated and compared to cap weights annually. The long and short positions are adjusted accordingly. The sector neutrality is adjusted at that annual reconstitution. The weights are then normalized within each sector so that the resulting sector weights in both the long and the short portfolios represent the sector weights of the thousand largest companies by fundamental index weight. Then the index is rebalanced monthly so that it has equal dollar investments in both the long and the short portfolios. And the reason for that is if the short portfolio is winning, we don't want to get net short over time. And if the long portfolio is winning, we don't want to get net long in the portfolio over time. So let's look at some of the uh, performance. The correlations with major asset classes, well, this is not being a market neutral strategy in the sense of having zero beta. It has had positive beta. The correlation with the S&P and with the MSCI World Index has been 0.4. Why is that? The reason for that is that the companies that are big fundamentally these days tend to be um, things like financial services companies, which these days tend to be relatively high beta. And the result of that is that the portfolio has a um, high beta orientation on the long end and a low beta orientation on the short end. There will be market environments in which that's not necessarily the case, in which the opposite could happen. We'll rarely find that the beta drifts outside of, let's say, plus 0.5 to minus 0.5. And boy, isn't it a good thing that it had a positive correlation in a bull market. Then the correlation with fixed income, apropos of the fact that Fundamental Index has rather favored financial services over this time, uh, is the sensitivity to interest rates, whereby the uh, uh, negative correlation to the fixed income markets show up. And we can also see down at the bottom of this table that the correlation with hedge funds suggests that this strategy does behave rather like some of the hedge funds that are available out there. So one can think of this as being uh, an ETF that provides hedge fund-like strategy at an ETF-like fee. Well, that's awfully interesting. Then if we turn attention to the results, what we find is that the long-short index, the return on the long-short index over the last one year produced a 12% return with 4.8% volatility. The sharp ratio has been aberrantly high. I'd love to be able to say that 2.5 sharp ratio. I'd love to thump my chest and say, look at that sharp ratio. Isn't it amazing? No, it's abnormal. 
The three-year result, 3.4%, reflects the fact that the prior two years, 2011 and 2012, were growth market years. Value was savaged. Value underperformed badly. Fundamental index, by going long the companies that are deep value and short the companies that are extreme growth, winds up getting savaged in a year that's rough on value, a year in which growth stocks are soaring. And so the three-year return of 3.4% um, looks awful for a three-year return. But A, keep in mind, this is an absolute return strategy. It's not intended to beat the stock market. It certainly isn't intended to beat a bull market in stocks. It's an absolute return-oriented strategy. And B, it's a positive return in a very hostile environment for a value-oriented strategy. The sharp ratio is north of 0.5. And since the launch of the strategy, the long-short index has had a 4.4% return with a sharp ratio of 0.7. The S&P, we've had a bull market. This is not designed to beat a bull market. This is your diversification away from stocks. If stocks were minus 32%, this would be just as easily likely to have a plus 12% return. In fact, in bear markets, value usually beats growth. So it would be totally unsurprising if the raw strategy, the long-short index, produced really unusually good results in a bear market. So. The positive returns you see here for the long-short index have nothing to do with the direction of the stock market. That's one of the beauties of this strategy. It's a strategy that's designed to behave in a fashion that, in the long run, is utterly independent of which way the market's going. In the short run, over the last three years, it certainly has had a positive correlation. In the long run, it's not likely to. In terms of our sector allocation, you can see the broad sector neutrality of the long and the short portfolio. Uh, in this next exhibit, I won't dwell on the exhibit. You can see that the financial sector is the largest on both the long and the short side. That's because the financial sector is the largest in the US economy. Energy and healthcare and technology are, and consumer cyclical uh, are roughly tied for second place. Those are other very big sectors in the US economy. And once again, we seek approximate uh, sector neutrality by roughly matching the long and the short side. And in terms of what companies are represented, oh my goodness, look at the companies on the left. Within their sectors, these are the deep value names. And the companies on the right, within their sectors, these are the popular, beloved, um, safe haven companies, growth companies, the sky is the limit companies, the companies that are priced so that nothing better ever go wrong. Well, isn't that the kind of company that is already amply represented in stock market portfolios. And I'm going to close here on this exhibit of characteristics, because I think this is just a marvelous way of capturing the nature of the RALS strategy. The long side of the portfolio has a PE ratio pretty cheap, 14 times earnings. The short portfolio a little expensive, 22 times earnings. And then it gets even better. Price to book value, 1.5 times book for the long. That's pretty cheap. Short companies that have a price to book value of 3.6, better than a 2 to 1 ratio. Price to sales ratio, 0.6 versus 3.1, a 5 to 1 ratio. The companies in our short portfolio are selling, on average, for 300% of their annual sales. The companies in our long portfolio are priced, on average, at just 60% of their annual sales. 
Weighted average market cap, nearly equal. These are very liquid lists of companies. And the dividend yield gives a 60 basis point spread in favor of the long portfolio. Uh, almost enough to cover the fee of the portfolio. So the overall structure of the portfolio is one that has the value character that we would expect out of a fundamental index strategy. Let me turn the discussion over to Joanne and uh, then open it up to questions. Joanne, over to you. Great, Rob. Thank you so much. Um, it's my great pleasure to be here today and, and share the podium with Rob and discuss how we at ProShares have worked with Rafi and his team to help package this strategy, uh, in effect the alpha of fundamental indexing, into an ETF. Um, just first, by way of background, you know, our main mission here at ProShares is to help investors build better portfolios by providing access to alternative investments. And we want to do that with the liquidity, transparency, and cost effectiveness of ETFs. Now, you know, when we talk about alternatives, you always have to start with a definition. We consider them here to be any investment that's not a traditional or conventional long-only position in equities, U.S. fixed income, or cash. And generally, like this strategy, they're not highly correlated to the returns of traditional investments. So these traditional investments have left many investors feeling vulnerable to market volatility and low returns. And they're looking for new approaches to reach their financial goals. And, and so they're looking for strategies like this that help to reduce volatility, uh, reduce downside risk, and also have some good return features. Now, this particular strategy fits into a category we have here at ProShares called hedge strategies. You may have learned first about ProShares but with our geared funds or leverage and inverse ETFs that are used for more tactical purposes. And we also have ETFs that provide exposure to expected volatility and expected inflation. But the two categories on the left, global fixed income uh, and hedge strategies, are really more strategic and are intended as buy and hold positions for, for investors. So, uh, so turning to the next slide, I think that it's also useful to see where this Rolf, uh ETF fits within hedge strategies, within the different types of, uh, of equity-based um, hedge strategies that we offer in ETFs. So on the left side, you see there some private equity, uh, a long-short strategy, CSM, with a beta of one, and a dividend strategy that is based on uh, an equal-weighted portfolio of dividend growth stocks, Noble. Those all are more equity bucket um, hedge, hedge strategies. They have betas greater than 0.5, typically. But on the right side this are, are three categories that um, would be obvious candidates for the alternatives bucket. And, um, you know, and some are broad-based, like hedge fund replication. And this particular strategy, um, with its lower beta, you know, would be somewhere in between a, what you might call a long-short strategy or market-neutral strategy. And I'll go into that a bit more as we uh, go through some of, these, some of the slides here. So um, if we look and if we look at the next slide, you know, I think that Rob has covered this very well, but it's good to think about what what is going on within Rawls. And I like to characterize it as smart beta transformed into an alpha strategy. So uh, you know, I think we have uh, you know, there's been increasing interest in, uh, in alternative weighting schemes for the equity bucket, whether that is based on uh, fundamentals, on dividends, on volatility features. Um, and so certainly, uh, you know, Rafi has a number of, of products uh, that, that are with benchmarks out there to, to use to access this, this smart data. But, you know, Rawls is, is really the, the only ETF that is constructed as a long-short strategy. And we're taking it, and as, as Rob has explained, we're, uh, first of all, making it both a long and short dollar-neutral strategy. And then we're narrowing in on those stocks that are the most mispriced 
in fundamental weights versus market cap weights. And so that is, that is what goes into the, the holdings uh, that are set once a year and that are rebalanced to be dollar neutral every month. So to me, the portfolio construction is starting with bottom-up stock selection, and it's really a, quite a unique alternative in itself to other long-short approaches that are commonly used in mutual funds and ETFs. So definitely it's rules-based, and that makes it easy to put in an ETF with, and disclose the holdings, and it has great liquidity. Um, but, you know, many rules-based strategies are quantitative in nature, and this is really a fundamental, you know, it, it, it's, it's sorting stocks based on, on their fundamental features, and that's what drives what is included uh, in both the long and short exposure. So uh, this just a reminder of the construction. Sector neutrality is key and very helpful, I think, in managing the overall risk um, and keeping it to be about half the risk of full equity exposure. And the dollar neutral uh, rebalancing monthly also helps in keeping, keeping the risk uh, of, the, of the index and the ETF uh, in, a, in a manageable uh, place relative to equities. Um, so uh, the top, it's really the top and bottom quintile within each sector. The number of stocks on the long side is 225 and about 230 on the short side. So uh, on the next slide, you know, I'm just reminding you, and Rob has gone through this in talking about the characteristics, uh, the largest companies on the long and the short side and the sector weighting. So we have put them here to, re to review them all on one slide. And I think you can see here this, the difference. This is, this is updated as of February 21st, 2014, so it might be slightly different than, uh, than what was shown for the index at the end of last year. But you can see you know, there is sometimes a little bit of a drift in the sector weightings. Uh, as, as market conditions change, but still they're very close, usually within just a 2% gap. I think right now consumer non-cyclicals are slightly overweighted on the long side uh, and consumer cyclicals slightly underweighted. And I think that uh, I want to just go back to the key point that, uh, that, that Rob mentioned, which is these index companies, the top companies on the short side, are probably ones that are you probably have a large weight in if you're pursuing index strategies that are cap weighted or have uh, active strategies that are benchmarked to cap weights. And so this, we think, is a very good diversifier from some of the other holdings in your portfolio. So I want to talk about uh, the performance of RALS, the ETF, uh, since it was launched December 2nd, 2010. And here we're looking at its performance from the launch date, over, basically over the last three years. And I think it's quite interesting to compare it to the HFRI indexes that it sort of lies in between. So as you know, hedge fund research uh, track has performance indexes of hedge funds, and there's an HFRI equity hedged index, which has mostly long short managers in it. But they, I think the average beta of this index is probably around 0.5, okay? So this tends, these managers tend to have sort of a net long bias. And then HFRI has, a, has also a market neutral index um, where managers go that seek to have a beta closer to zero. So we we've compared its performance over the last three years against these two, as well as to the Barclays US Ag. And then I think in terms of risk, these are the closest in risk. S&P 500, of course, has a volatility that is about twice uh, or more the, uh, the, the index is shown in this chart. So the annualized volatility of Rawls is around 6% over these three years. This is, this is somewhat less than the HFRI equity hedged index, but about twice that of a market neutral strategy and about twice that of, of the Barclays U.S. Ag. But you can also see uh, in this chart sort of the negative 
correlation coming out with fixed income. That, of course, the highest point in fixed income was about a, a year and a half ago, and um, which coincided with the, the biggest drawdown over this three-year period in, in the in the Rawls uh, ETF. So, at the, and since uh, since about mid 2012. Uh, along with the HFRI equity hedged index, the uh, Rawls ETF has, has posted pretty strong performance. And so right now, these are all actually pretty close to one another in terms of cumulative return. So the other way to look at the uh, return statistics uh, or, and also risk statistics is on the, the next page. And here we show the 2013 return, two-year return, three-year return annualized, uh, for all of these indexes, uh, the HFRI, S&P 500, Barclays Ag, as well as Rawls on both a market price and a net asset value basis. And so if you look at this, you can see that the one, two, and three-year return for Rawls are generally between or comparable with those of the HFRI equity hedge and equity market neutral. Um, and so basically, you know, the basic takeaway is that Rawls has generally outperformed the bond market more recently and has certainly lower volatility than, than the equity benchmarks. Last year was a strong year for value versus growth, and so uh, this uh, had, had quite good returns in excess of about 11%. Uh, compared to the index, that would be, of course, uh, it has a 95 basis point fee, so that would have come be, be attributed the difference with the of the index versus the ETF. Um, correlation. I just want to return to some correlation statistics here of the ETF. So these are data based on the ETF Rawls uh, with the HFRI equity hedge market neutral index, the composite. So uh, point, about 0.35, 0.4 correlation. Some positive correlation with equities, um, which shouldn't be surprising over this time frame. And um, you know, I think it's really, you know, I think it's very important to to have and helpful to have this negative correlation to fixed income because investors are looking for low-risk alternatives to equities that are not uh, sensitive to the risk of rising rates. And so this certainly checks the box on that one. So uh, I'd like to uh, provide sort of a quick summary here as I, as I finish on what are, we believe are the key reasons to invest in Rawls and talk just finally about its fit in the portfolio. So there is certainly a lot of interest in investors looking at smart data and adding, to, uh, adding, adding this as a strategy within their equity allocation. And uh, you know, I think that this is it's sort of earlier days for this, but it makes sense if you believe that smart beta makes sense to see if there's a version of this that could also be a good fit within an alternative allocation or long short allocation. And I think that this, and what we're doing in this strategy and what is, is going on within the index that is being provided by Rafi is to focus in in, in just on those stocks that are the most mispriced, right, top and bottom quintile within each sector. And the dollar neutral uh, rebalancing helps manage the risk. And so this is really sort of the purest form of trying to get the alpha from fundamental, fundamental indexing. And it has a good um, characteristic that actually you, it's easy to to incorporate in an ETF because the holdings are transparent. There's um, uh, not, you know, they're, they're liquid stocks is the average market cap of about 50 billion. So, um, so I think that it's a, a good example of something that is somewhat different from a hedge fund type bottom up uh, approach uh, to doing an absolute return or long short strategy. And it really lends itself to uh, use within an ETF. And I think it's always important to keep in mind that it has been showing competitive risk-adjusted returns, and these 
low correlations to both equities and fixed income that we're looking for in an alternative allocation. So the obvious fit in the portfolio would be into the alternatives bucket as a key holding. And I think we've talked about the fact that it has um, good diversification features to stocks and bonds, but I think it's also a good diversifier to other more conventional long, short, or market neutral strategies that might be either more fundamental, discretionary uh, from a portfolio manager or more quantitatively based. There's another place that it could fit, and that is actually in the equity bucket, right? If you have a big uh, orientation to market cap in your equity bucket, either because you have index exposures or a lot of active strategies that are benchmarked to market cap indexes, a small dose of this in an equity bucket could help give you a fundamental tilt. So I, I think that um, those are some of the main points I wanted to make, and I look forward to, uh, to questions and further discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Rob, and uh, thanks, Joanne, uh, and uh, thanks for leaving some time for some Q&A. Uh, always fun. We have some good ones coming in from the audience. Rob, let me start with you. Uh, what environments can we expect this strategy to struggle in? You know, it, it's interesting. We started out of the box in 2011 and 12 in exactly that kind of scenario. Um, when you have a growth-dominated market where growth stocks are winning, fundamental index will struggle. Uh, growth stocks win about, oh, a little over a third of the time, historically. Value stocks win a little under one, uh, two-thirds of the time. And what you find is that fundamental index lags uh, modestly in growth markets and then tends to win big in value markets. So what did we have? We lagged a little bit in 11 and 12, and we got it back with room to spare in 2013. Now, if you look at value managers, Value managers had a terrible three-year result. They just had a terrible three-year result because they underperformed in 2011 and 12. They got a little of it back in 13, but not much. This has been a growth three-year cycle. But fundamental index trades into value when value is underperforming so that when value comes back, you're now more heavily exposed to value. So the fundamental long-short strategy does much the same. It contra-trades into a deeper, more aggressive value tilt when value has been underperforming. And so the result is that um, we got a snapback that was just marvelous. Um, and that's the nature of the process. So the first answer to your question is when growth wins, we're going to struggle. Second answer to your question is, in a bull market, we will appear to struggle because people will look at the results of any absolute return or long short strategy and are going to say, hey, I could have made more in this bull market over here. That's not the purpose of this strategy. If, you, if I could take the liberty to back up a couple of slides, one might look at this slide, slide 33, and say, looking at the um, three-year results, 3% 3 for long short, 16 for the S&P. Oh, my goodness, what, what do I need this for? Uh, you need it for the very simple reason that the three is in an aberrantly hostile environment for this strategy, and the 16 is for an aberrantly benign environment for stocks in which trillions of dollars of money have been printed around the world by central bankers. My goodness, what happens in a more challenging environment for the stock market? How many folks on this call really think that we're going to see 16% a year over the next three years for stocks? If you see single-digit returns for stocks, 5% a year the next three years. Negative for the next three years. Well, what happens then? Value would be beating growth. And if value is beating growth, then you might find 
The long short strategy is clipping out 10% a year. This is your hedge against difficult circumstances for stocks. That's the role for this strategy. Right. Now, Joanne, I wanted to bring you into this. Uh, there seems to be some questions, a number of them coming in from the audience, about what else is out there uh, in uh, in terms of uh, this kind of a long short uh, uh, strategy that has the, the great downside protection, some of the nuances Rob was talking about, what uh, What's what are investors looking at, and what and how does how do you situate Rawls in that context in terms of price and performance and characteristics and what have you? Right. So uh, you know, I think that this is this is the only ETF that has this uh, long fundamental, you know, short market cap type structure. Um, you know, it depends on how you think of the competition. There are other. Uh, you know, there are many long short mutual funds out there and a few other long short ETFs that are you know bottom up stock based which I consider this to be um, uh, but you know more they're more you know traditional uh, certainly there's certainly many hedge fund managers that have a value orientation right but um, but the, but the, but this is more this is different in that, in that, in that it's it's rules based and it tends to have, a lower beta um, than a, uh, a hedge fund-like long short strategy. Now there are mutual funds uh, that go uh, managed uh, out of another another company in Newport Beach uh, that go long. I think they're called uh, fundamental advantage mutual funds that go long the fundamental index in the U.S. or global, and then short a market cap index. Um, but they are, you know, we would consider them uh, less, you know, this much a pure way of getting the alpha because in that type of strategy where you're long, you know, the fundamental index and short a market cap index, you would have a lot of overlap in holdings, right? So some of the same stocks with, you know, slightly different weights would be on the long and the short side. So this, by just having the top and bottom quintile stocks, you know, gets you more, uh, you know, leverage or exposure to the uh, benefits of the fundamental index approach versus the market cap approach. In addition, um, you know, this uh, this this is you know built around, in effect, sort of cash collateral. So, whereas those other mutual funds, I believe, have an active fixed income portfolio as the base. So this is this is you know, I think the purest way of getting uh, getting at this uh, this concept. If you believe that stocks get mispriced, um, this in a competitive context would be the purest play. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, there's some confusion about rebalancing here. I don't know which uh, of you want to take that. Uh, uh, I think some of the audience seems to think there's monthly rebalancing. I've got one question suggesting why annual rebalancing. Uh, can, can you straighten up some of that confusion on the rebalancing front? And, and, and uh, as, a, as a follow-up, what, what does the rebalancing do in terms of tax consequences? Sure. The rebalancing is on the index, not on the holdings of the fund. The um, uh, the index uh, rebalances once a year. The holdings of the fund are then the responsibility of pro shares to rebalance the holdings to um, match the index. Um, I believe ETF rules require a 95% match. Turnover um, is <clears throat> um, relatively low, surprisingly low, on fundamental index strategies. And so the uh, turnover required by the rebalancing is, is relatively modest. But uh, pro, ch pro shares uh, uh, looks to do the rebalance. And please, uh, Joanne, step in if I misspeak sure, on any yeah. of this. I guess looks, yeah. maybe, maybe a, the, way I, the way I think is an easier way to understand it is, I, you know, the the stocks are selected just once a year. So once a year is the sort within each sector, right, to determine the top quintile stocks and the bottom quintile stocks in terms of fundamental weight versus cap weight. Okay? So that so once a year that happens with the identification of the stocks. What goes on on a monthly basis is that is the 
the index that the index and we accordingly as we manage the portfolio rebalances to be dollar neutral equal dollar amount longs and shorts so for example if in the prior month which is what we hope happens the longs have outperformed the shorts let's say by 3% right the, the long side will have more value. So we would be, in effect, selling off some of the, uh, a slice, a 3% slice of the long stocks and buying a 3% slice of the short stocks. So in a way, what's going on a monthly basis is sort of taking profits or covering losses to get it back to dollar neutral. I, I think that is an easy, you know, might be the way it, 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 you can see it, ha the way it would happen. And, you know, with, in terms of, um, so it has relatively low turnover. You know, there's not that big of a change in the stocks from year to year. And then this dollar neutral process every month is, is you know, it's, it's typically just a, a couple percent at most. Um, and so, like most ETFs, it's tax efficient um, in terms of as it deals with uh, the inflows and the outflows. And, um, you know, and we, you know, we have not, as with most of our ETFs, seen any reason to uh, to have any capital gains distributions in managing it over the course of the three years. Okay, thanks. Uh, we are just about out of time, but I'm going to I'm going to ask one more question here. Just uh, there was so many we're leaving on the table here. Uh, Joanne, you you made reference a moment ago. You could uh, integrate this into the equity sleeve of a portfolio. Um, uh, I mean, I presume you're serious, or, or could one also potentially allocate a certain percentage toward equity and fixed income? I mean, how do you think about this? Conceptualize it. <laughs> right. Well, you know, I mean, I think it does over a certain time. Have a uh, have a somewhat positive beta to equities, and you know the correlate. I just really thought of it more as a pure alpha strategy or overlay strategy within within fixed income within equities, because the equity weights tend to be market cap, right? So it's a nice complement to that. But certainly, yes, I mean it could go into a, a fixed income as an alpha strategy to append on to a a base, you know, short term fixed income allocation, right? Um, but uh, but but I think more people would, would would probably see that it would be an obvious place in the alternatives bucket. But if you didn't have an alternatives bucket, yeah. right? Yeah, you could do that. Mm -hmm. Say, hey, Arlie, uh, there's a yeah. lot of good questions here. Could I suggest that you have that you route all of the questions to um, Joanne and me, and we have our teams get back to the folks. I also see a request to see have the slides forwarded. I don't know whether um, <clears throat> I don't know whether Pro shares or, uh, or or whether the ETF group can uh, ETF.com can permit distribution of the hard of the electronic copy of the slides. I'd have no problem with it. Yeah, I believe uh, that's that's how we're going to proceed, right, Joanne? You guys have no objection to that. I, you, I typically will tell our uh, our guests that they are uh, they will get it within 24 to 48 hours. So yeah, I, I don't see a problem with that. And yeah, I will certainly uh, aggregate the questions. I think you're right, Rob. There are quite a lot of interesting questions here, and I think it would uh, it would be sensible to uh, to indulge uh, all, all the all the interest for sure. Uh, I love that, to have my team answer them. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, under, final understood. observation is uh, those who want to be on the distribution list for our research white papers. Feel free to drop me an email, arnot at rallc.com. Uh, that's arnot at rallc.com. Uh, we'll be happy to add you to the distribution list for our research white papers. Um, great questions, Joanne. A privilege to uh, be on this call with you. Ollie, thank you for setting it up. Thank you very much, uh, Rob and Joanne, uh, and thanks a lot to, to all the guests, all the good, great questions, and thank you, Rob, for suggesting that. That's, what, that's how we'll proceed. Uh, so that, thanks, everyone, for attending. And, uh, again, as I said a moment ago, uh, you will be receiving that deck uh, within 24 to 48 hours, and you'll get an email uh, instructing you as to how to uh, get it. On that note, uh, on behalf of all my guests and all my colleagues here at ETF.com, I'm Ollie Ludwig wishing you all a very pleasant afternoon. Thank you all. Bye.